but schools is the concept that's known as punctuated equilibrium. You ever heard of that? Anybody ever heard of punctuated equilibrium? It was developed by Stephen J. Gould, G-O-U-L-D, from Harvard University. Anybody ever heard of Dr. Gould from Harvard? A couple of you? Listen, all of you should know this name. Remember this name because you know what? Dr. Gould is now America's number one most prominent, well-known evolutionist. With the passing away of Carl Pagan, I mean um, Sagan, with the passing away of Carl Sagan, how many of you remember Dr. Sagan? How many of you remember him? Raise your hands, the ones who remember Dr. Sagan. And he had you know, his Cosmos series on TV and all that. Well, again, I, just, I think you'll find it interesting when I share this with you that Dr. Sagan, has, uh, he no longer believes in evolution. He has become a creationist. He's dead. He knows better. But anyway. So they're teaching punctuated equilibrium. What is it? Now listen to me. What is, what is this punctuated equilibrium thing? What does it mean? What does it say? I'm going to quote it almost verbatim from the textbook. Here's what it says. Punctuated equilibrium. Since there is no record of evolution in the fossils. Did you hear that? They admit there's no hint of evolution in the fossil record, then what must have happened, there was this, quote, quantum leap forward. Does that sound like good science to you? Huh? This quantum leap forward in the evolutionary process, and it happens so fast, there's no record of it. So, you know, take our word for it, I guess. I don't think so. You know, it's funny because, see, for years and years and years, they used to say that there's no evidence of evolution in the fossils because it happened so slowly, slowly. And now they're saying, no, we were wrong. Uh, there's no record of it because it was so fast. Which is it? And you know what? It's neither one because both of them are nonsense. Okay? Very quickly, let me cover a couple of things. I want to say a couple of words about... Um, the cavemen, because, you know, you probably have some questions. You say, well, well Bob, uh, isn't there kind of uh, strong evidence to uh, say that we, you know, we descended from apes? I mean, uh, what about all these cavemen? Uh, what about Nebraska man, Neanderthal man, Cro-Magnon man, Piltdown man, Heidelberg man, Java man, Lucy? What about all these? Oh, there's a whole bunch of them, aren't there? Folks, uh, I'm going to cover this very quickly. All of those so-called hominid creatures, caveman candidates, today will fall into one of three categories. And many of them have been reclassified into one of three categories. Okay? The first category is fully human, homo sapien, no relationship to the simian, the ape family at all. Uh, I'll give you, for example, Cro-Magnon man and Neanderthal man, probably the two most well-known cavemen, right? Cro-Magnon, Neanderthal. It just so happens that both of them today, even your evolutionary anthropologist will tell you that if you were to take the remains, the skeletal remains of Cro-Magnon, Neanderthal, flesh them out, put flesh on them, put clothes on them, set them down in this pew, nobody would even notice them. They look just like us. Here's the kicker. Both Cro-Magnon man and Neanderthal man had larger brains than we have, modern man, by over 12%. Larger brains. And folks, even though, yes, it's true, larger brain does not necessarily equate with higher intelligence, that's true, you certainly wouldn't expect your distant ancestors to have bigger brains than you have. Do you follow me? That's, I mean, that's just nonsense. The second category is fully ape, no relationship to man at all. What are called the Ramapithecines and the Australopithecines, of which I'm going to use Lucy as my example, will fall into this category. Lucy is still regarded 
as the most likely missing link among your hardcore uh, anthropologists that, that really cling to this evolutionary idea. And uh, just, here's, here's the story. Lucy, which was discovered by Dr. Johansson back in about 1973 in uh, East Africa. Lucy is about three feet tall. And if you saw, if I had with me right now a complete skeleton of Lucy, which there is not, and a complete skeleton of a pygmy chimpanzee, there's not one person in this room, including myself, that could tell them apart. Nobody can tell them apart. You say, well, wait a minute. How did this thing get into the textbook, and how come everybody regard well, not everybody, but how come all these anthropologists regard it as the missing link? Well, because Dr. Johansson says it is. <laughs> That's basically why. And he bases, listen to me, he bases his assumption of Lucy being a hominid creature on the fact, he says that the pelvis bone, listen to me, you're going to find this outrageous, the pelvis bone and the knee bone show a propensity or a, 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 an, an articulation of upright movement. Do you follow me? That this thing was starting to walk upright. Therefore, therefore, it must be one of our ancestors. Now folks, listen to me. Number one, you can go out and find any, any number of evolutionary anthropologists that will disagree with his interpretation of that. I mean, it's just his interpretation. But forget that. But here's the good part. The, the pelvis bone and the knee bones that he used to make his case, those bones were found four miles away from Lucy a year later in a different strata of rock. Did you hear what I said? Those bones, am I making this up? No, no, this is all, this is easy to verify, it's all documented. Those bones were found over four miles away a year later in a, in a different strata of rock. Is there any possibility that those bones could even belong to Lucy, what we call Lucy? No. More. I'm going to share this with you real quickly. How many of you remember Dr., uh, not Dr., Dick Cavett? Dick Cavett, the talk show host. Dick Cavett, right? Most of you. Dr. Johansson was being interviewed on national television by Dick Cavett. National television. Listen to what I'm saying. You can get a transcript of this interview. What I'm getting ready to tell you is public domain, folks. It was on national television. The reason I'm saying that is because what I'm going to tell you is going to sound so outlandish that you're, you're going to have a tendency to think, Bob, you're making this up. And I'm not. I'm not making this up. In the interview, Dick Cavett looked at uh, uh, Dr. Johansson. He was, Dick Cavett was holding what he thought was the skull of Lucy in his hand. And he said, uh, Dr. Johansson, um, what are these two little uh, dark spots here in the back of this skull? And Dr. Johansson, you could tell he didn't want to answer the question. He kind of hem hauled around a little bit. And when he finally answered Dick Cavett, he said, well, those are the actual bone fragments that we found. Dick Cavett looked at him, he said, what? He said, what's the rest of the skull? What, what's, what, what is this I'm holding in my hand? And uh, Dr. Johansson said, well, that's a plaster of Paris reconstruction that we thought it might look like, and then we dyed that with chemicals to match the bone fragments. There's more. Later on in this same interview on national television, with <laughs> everybody listening, Dick Cavett said, uh, Dr. Johansson, how did you make the determination that these bones were 3.5 million years old? I mean, you know, he just wanted to know how, the, how they come to that, you know, maybe radiometric dating or whatever. Dr. Johansson said on national television, as we were flying into this area of Africa, they're up in the air, in the airplane. As we were flying into this, this area of Africa, we could tell that anything that we found down there would have to be at least three to four million years old. Folks, I'm telling you, you just, and there's so many things I could tell you. See, you're talking about, listen, you're talking about a category of people whose entire career 
can be made on the discovery of a bone fragment. These people can become filthy rich overnight if they come up with some kind of a missing link bone. You follow me? We're talking talk shows. We're talking books and magazine articles. We're talking being offered uh, professorships at the most prestigious universities on the planet. We're talking about the approbation and esteem and envy of their colleagues, I think, which motivates a lot of them more than anything else. So with all that writing on it, is there, any, is there any tendency, any temptation at all for them to fabricate the evidence to make it fit? It happens all the time. That's the third category, fraud. Fraud, hoaxes. And this, this area of science, anthropology, is rife. That means filled to the brim with hoaxes and fraud. All over the place. Java man exposed as a fraud. Piltdown man exposed as a, as a big hoax. Uh, Nebraska man. Let me just camp there for a moment. We'll move on. Nebraska man. Some of you may, should remember Nebraska man because when you were in school, this was what was in the textbooks. Nebraska man was in the public school textbooks for over 45 years as the missing link. How many of you remember the Scopes Monkey Trial in D Dayton, Tennessee? The Scopes Monkey Trial. The movie Inherit the Wind. William Jennings Bryan and Clarence Darrell was based on the Scopes Monkey Trial. The evidence that was cited in the Scopes Monkey Trial was Nebraska Man. Hundreds of doctoral dissertations written on Nebraska Man. Whew. With all of that, there must have been some really impressive evidence, right? A single tooth. A single tooth. Was it a human tooth? Somebody know? What was it? Does anybody know? It was a pig's tooth. It was later found to be a tooth from an extinct species of pig. Nebraska man. Folks, I'm just telling you that, again, it's over and over. See, this is, you know, this is all I've done for the last you know, many, many years of my life. You know, I've been doing this full time for eight years. And the more you delve into these areas, the more you understand about uh, the different areas of science dealing with this subject, you are just left dumbfounded, the, just dumbfounded at the dishonesty, the hypocrisy and so on that you find among the, uh, the science community today in their attempts to try and promote evolution regardless of the facts in spite of the evidence, overwhelming evidence to refute it. Okay. Anyway, uh, we're going to cover the dinosaurs in just a moment, so don't run off, all right? Just stay where you are. Bob Swenson, Director of Creation Science Ministry, uh, thanking you for the opportunity to continue with our program this evening and focus our attention on dinosaurs. Anybody interested in dinosaurs? Oh yeah, of course the kids always raise their hands. But I think the adults, you know, find it, dinosaurs just about as uh, intriguing as the kids do, to be honest with you. Anyway, let's go ahead and get started. We're gonna talk about dinosaurs this evening. Here are some of the questions that we're going to address, some of the questions that we'll take a look at as we uh, do our discussion on dinosaurs. First of all, are they mentioned in the Bible? What do you think, folks? Do you think dinosaurs are mentioned in the Scriptures? How many say yes? How many say no? How many just don't know? How many are too lazy to raise their hand? <laughs> okay, are they mentioned in the Bible? Well, I think they probably are. Where did they come from? Well, I think as a Christian, if you say anything other than from the hand of God, uh, there's a problem. <laughs> Uh, I'm a Christian. I believe they were created by God uh, along with everything else. How long ago did they live? Everybody who believes that dinosaurs lived millions of years ago, raise your hand. Anybody? You want to hear something interesting? I have been in some churches where half the people in the <laughs> congregation raised their hand. And that was after I did my message on the young earth, you know. So that was, I thought, well. Somebody's not listening. 
But anyway, um, you know, folks, again, there are, there are a large number of Christians who do not believe in dinosaurs. Did you know that? Because we are so indoctrinated in the thinking of dinosaurs with millions of years ago. And if you believe the Bible and if you, if you believe the world is young, a few thousand years old, how do you reconcile that with creatures that supposedly lived millions of years ago? So some Christians don't even believe dinosaurs ever existed. They did. They existed in huge numbers. And uh, we're going to take a look at some of that evidence in a few moments. What happened to them? I don't think there's any question that the vast majority of dinosaurs died out at the time of the flood. The reason I can say that is because, folks, there are millions and millions of dinosaur fossils filling up warehouses and museums around the globe. Millions of dinosaur bones. And they're excavating new ones all the time. So it's very clear that uh, there were large numbers of them that perished at the time of the flood. And then the big question, the overriding question, the, the question that keeps people awake at night, they can't sleep, trying to figure out if Noah took them on the ark. What do you think? Did Noah take them on the ark, yes or no? Yes, raise your hand. No, raise your hand. Who, who's fibbing? Who actually believes that, they, that he did not take them on the ark, but you didn't want to get embarrassed by raising your hand? <laughs> okay, look, let me make a very, very important point right now. My important point is, it doesn't matter what you think. <laughs> it doesn't matter what I think, right? As Christians, there's only one thing that should concern us. And that's what does the Bible say, right? What does the Word of God say on any given subject? You know, it's like, take anything, folks. Take, take capital punishment. You know, we all have, everybody has an opinion, right? People are famous for having opinions. Opinions are like noses, see? You're nervous, right? <laughs> Wondering what I was going to say. But uh, look, Everybody has an opinion, and uh, I guarantee you, you can find a large number of Christians who are against capital punishment, right? As a Christian, we must develop a mindset that says that I'm going to believe what the Bible says. I'm going to base my convictions and my values and everything else on the Word of God. Not how I feel, not what dear old Dr. So-and-so said, unless he, you know, lined up with the Bible. Now, uh, as far as uh, Noah taking them on the ark, and I'm, I'll be honest with you, a lot of times when I ask that question, there will be a l large numbers of uh, people raising their hand saying, no, he did not take them on the ark. And the point is, the Bible very clearly teaches that Noah took at least two of everything on the ark. Is that true? Yes. So if you believe the Bible, as a Christian, you have to believe that Noah took them on the ark. And then you say, well, wait a minute, Bob. If that's true, how did he get those big old huge monster creatures on his boat? And the answer is very simple. God brought the animals to Noah. He brought them to Noah. And you know what? God would have brought two little tiny baby dinosaurs. Babies. One pink, one blue. <laughs> See? No purple? I don't think so. Because, look, it's common sense. Baby dinosaurs would have been smaller and easier to handle. They would have required less food. They would have made a lot less dino duty, <laughs> which you laugh at, but if you had to clean it up, you would find that important. And uh, the babies would have lived much longer after you landed the ark, which fulfilled the purpose for which they were taken on the ark, which was to do what? Produce offspring and replenish the species, sure. Not all dinosaurs were big. In fact, if the truth be known, and that's what we're interested in, the truth, most dinosaurs were no bigger than a horse or a cow. Many species of dinosaurs were about the size of a chicken, or a house cat. 
Some of them are huge. Here is a warehouse full of dinosaur fossils. I don't know if it shows up that well, but there's a man standing there on the left of the screen, a man standing there. You can see that some of those bones are bigger than he is. But here, this will give you a real good idea. There's a reconstruction of the largest fossilized dinosaur leg ever excavated. The dinosaur that went with that leg would have been somewhere close to 150 feet long. That's half the length of a football field in length. Would have been over 90 feet, about, about 90 feet tall. Somewhere between 75 and 90 feet tall. And would have weighed over 100 tons. So some of them got to be absolutely huge, okay? And I'll explain how that was possible a little bit later on. Are they mentioned in the Bible? We're going to look at a couple of passages of Scripture, both of them in Job. In Job uh, chapter 40, verse 15, it says, Behold now behemoth, which I made with thee. This is God talking to Job. And the point that God is making, God is saying basically, Job, look, you've got all these problems, you've suffered all of these losses, uh, you're the all-time champion sufferer and so on. And here I am, you know, God has come to minister to Job and to comfort Job. And you know what uh, God says to Job? I'm the creator. I'm the creator of this world. And that's all you need to know. And here, check this out. See, see Behemoth over here? I made that. that that's, one, that's one of my creations right there, Job. Okay? What I'm saying to you folks if you like bottom lines, which I, I do, I'm a bottom line kind of person. You know, let's cut through everything. Just give me the bottom line. The bottom line, if you're a Christian, is to know that God is real, is to know that God exists, that He is exactly who He says He is in the Bible, and He's in complete and total control of this thing we call reality. There is no circumstance in your life, not one circumstance, over which God does not exercise complete control. You know God's eternal. You know that before this world ever even began, before He ever created this universe, God knew everything that would ever happen throughout all of human history. Do you know that? Do you think that when we yell, God help, in time, we get in trouble and we say, Oh God, help me. Do you think that it takes Him by surprise? Do you have this idea of God scrambling around, some, just running around in a panic, thinking, oh, good grief, Brother Bob's in trouble. How, what am I going to do to help him? You know, God knew that problem would exist before the world ever began. God knew that I would pray that panicky prayer before the world ever began. And God provided the answer for that situation before the world ever began. As a friend of mine once said, in fact, it was my best friend, he led me to the Lord as my business partner in Atlanta, Georgia, about 30 years ago. And as Buck used to like to put it, he said, as Christians, when we understand God's control over the circumstances of our lives and everything, we can just kind of sit back in the, the, the Cadillac of life and just let God drive and enjoy the scenery. I like that imagery. Job 40, 15, it says, His strength is in his loins and his force is in the navel of his belly. Now, folks, I'm saying that this creature, which is described in Job 40, is a large land dinosaur. An awesome creature, a fearsome creature. And you say, well, wait a minute, Bob. You haven't said anything up to this point that would indicate that it is a dinosaur. In fact, Brother Bob, come here and look at this. I just discovered in my Bible, in the margin notes, margin notes, yes, it says that behemoth was probably an elephant or a hippopotamus. And you're up here trying to tell me it was a dinosaur. What's the deal? Well, first of all, you understand those margin notes are not inspired, right? <laughs> I mean... They're put in there to kind of help us. You know, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But folks, 
It says in verse 17, which I direct your attention to verse 17, the very next verse, it says that he moves his tail, behemoth moves his tail like a cedar tree. This creature called behemoth had a tail like a cedar tree, okay? Now, I've been to South Africa. I have actually driven through Kruger Game Reserve, the largest natural game reserve on the planet. I have been to zoos. I have seen picture books, and I'm sure that most of you have as well, right? You know what uh, elephants and hippopotamuses look like, don't you? Would any of you ever mistake one of these little ropey tails for, for a cedar tree? Huh? You'd have to be a cuckoo clock, wouldn't you? Okay? No, you're, when you're talking about a big, huge tail, we're talking about one of the large uh, land dinosaurs, probably an Apatosaurus, what used to be called the Brontosaurus. The Brontosaurus? No such thing. You know what the Brontosaurus was? It was a Diplocitus missing a head. They found the head of an Apatosaurus about two miles away, put it with that uh, Diplocitus, and that's what came to be called the Brontosaurus. Of course, now we know that. But anyway, uh, one of the large land dinosaurs, like the Diplocitus, the Patosaurus, maybe the Brachiosaurus. But anyway, the very next chapter in Job 41, in verse 1, we read about a creature called Leviathan. Can you draw out Leviathan with a hook? God is asking Job this rhetorical question. He is saying, can you catch this creature like you would a fish with a hook? Because what is described in Job 41 regarding Leviathan is another huge, terrifying, and I'll, I'll share you, t tell you why I say that in just a moment, this huge, terrifying creature, which I'm going to say was a, a marine, marine dinosaur. That means it spent at least part of its time in the water. Can you catch this thing with a hook or his tongue with a cord? Can you put a hook into his nose or bore his jaw through with a thorn? And so on. Now, I want to skip ahead to verse 19. Same chapter, verse, uh, chapter 41 of Job, but on further down, beginning in verse 19 through verse 21, listen as I read this part of the description of Leviathan. This is going to shock you if you haven't read this before. Out of his mouth go burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils goes smoke. His breath kindles coals and a flame goes out of his mouth. What does that sound like? Dragon? Do you think that, uh, that Pastor Ronnie has brought this guy in here to try and tell you that there were fire-breathing dragons on the earth? That's exactly what I'm trying to tell you because that's exactly what we find in the Bible. I don't, I don't have a problem with that, believing that. Do you? The Word of God tells me that there were dinosaurs running around loose that could sneeze fire and smoke. Man, there's no question in my mind that they, they existed, okay? Now, you might say, well, well, wait a minute. Hold on. You expect me to believe that there were these creatures that could actually sneeze fire and smoke, that fire, fire would come out of their body sort of thing? Well, if you have a problem with that, let me direct your attention to a creature called the Bombardier Beetle. Anybody ever heard of the Bombardier Beetle? Any, yeah, some of you? Okay. This little beetle, and when I say little, they're only about an inch long, and they're very commonly found. They're all over North America. They're... Uh, they have them in uh, Africa. We found that out when I was over in Africa. So they're, they're on other continents as well. But this little beetle has a very intriguing and very unusual defense mechanism. When this little beetle is about to be gobbled up by Mr. Toad or Mr. Frog, he'll just spin around. He's got this little spinning movement. He'll spin around and he'll shoot fire out of his little rear end. Sounds uncomfortable, doesn't it? <laughs> now, let's take just a moment. I want to point something out to you that you, I think you'll find interesting. Inside that little tiny little body is this unbelievably complex defense mechanism. 
Now, imagine inside that little tiny body, you've got two compartments. You've got one compartment where you've got hydrogen peroxide, all right? And in the other compartment, you've got hydroquinone, two different chemicals. And guess what happens when these chemicals come together? They explode. And that's where the fire and gases come from. But listen, you also have inside his body a combustion chamber. You've got inhibitor gases to keep it from happening. You've got anti-inhibitor gases to knock out the inhibitor gases so it can happen. You follow me? I mean, it's very, very sophisticated, very complex. Because, see, this has to work exactly right. Because if it doesn't work right, you can just say goodbye to Mr. Bombardier Beetle. See? <laughs> now, we laugh. We think that's funny, and it is funny. But you know what? If you were to try and explain the evolution of that process, no way. And if you even try to imagine the evolution of that process, you can, you can just picture these poor little beetles blowing themselves up all over the hillside, you know? But the idea or the concept of a creature existing with the ability to expel fire out of its body, hey, that's no big deal. We have creatures right now that can do it. They're called bombardier beetles. If God could give that ability to that beetle, does it stand to reason he could do the same thing for a dinosaur? Absolutely. No, I have no problem with that at all. In fact, there are several different species of dinosaur that have in the top of their skull a large, hollow cavity, a big empty spot in the top of their head that ties into their nasal passage that uh, scientists can't figure this out. They, they don't know why they have these things. These, why, why would they have this big empty spot in the top of their head? Well, folks, when the Bible tells me that there were certain species of dinosaurs that could breathe fire and smoke, and you find this big empty spot in the top of their head where that mechanism would be located, you figure it out. You remember I told you, uh, or did I tell you that, yeah, I did. I told you almost all ancient societies, all your ancient cultures believed in a worldwide flood. Remember that? Guess what? There's another belief that almost all of your ancient cultures share, and that is the belief in dragons. Almost all of your ancient cultures had their own dragon traditions and legends. You find cave drawings of dragons on every continent around the globe. It's a part of, of, of almost all of those ancient civilizations, okay? Again, anthropologically, that's very important evidence. Um, moving on, here's a picture of, can you all see this okay? The man on the right over there in the, the light blue, that's Dr. Clifford Wilson from Australia. Australia, where they like the fly of. And they watch Tai Vai. Anybody, can anybody talk like an Australian? <laughs> Say, no, and you can't either, Bob. But anyway, uh, Dr. Wilson had flown all the way from Australia to, to come to this excavation site in Texas. 